right, welcome back. Welcome back, I hope you had a lovely break, got something to eat, maybe a little something to drink. We're now entering early adulthood. So Pioneered, do you have any questions about this particular phase of life? Yes, will we use money? Will we find love with robots? Will we be controlled by tech? What will we wear? And how will it help us? Well, I live in Japan, and I can tell you people are already finding love with robots. But be that as it may, those are very interesting questions, and they're going to help guide our discussion through this phase, early adulthood. And here to tell us more about the future of finance, please welcome from Mangrove Capital Partners and the chairman of Wix, Mark Toulouse. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm my first time in Vienna. I'm excited to be here. And I'm particularly excited to introduce my friend Jeff. Uh, Jeff is the uh, co-founder of Skype. I knew, I knew Jeff many, many years ago. And he is now the co-founder of a new company called Oriente. Uh, Jeff has learned so many lessons across the Skype life, which is how to scale a business what the tenacity is required to actually be successful there. And I thought today we would spend a bit of time uh, kind of revisiting the past of Skype uh, and why it was successful, and then really spend the focus on how and why Jeff chose to go from something that I thought was pretty cool, giving away free phone calls, to try and to change the world of money. So Jeff, thanks again for being here, and, 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 uh, and it's exciting. Tell us a little bit about you know, why was Skype so successful at the beginning? Well, because we were solving, well, you were, Mark was our first investor in Skype, so he was aware of some of these things. Uh, the most important thing is that we were solving a real problem. And what I've seen a lot from entrepreneurs very often is they're very much focused on building a technology first that they find very uh, intellectually interesting to build, but it's not really solving a problem. Mm -hmm. So the reality was we started off as being a Wi-Fi sharing, apps for PDAs before there were apps. Yeah. And then we realized that we were living in Stockholm, me and Nicholas, Janus was in Denmark, and then Jan Talon and team was in Estonia, and it was very difficult to communicate. So, and it was expensive. So we basically, or Jan and built that, we were able to communicate better. So the point was what I learned was solving a problem is, is, is a major thing, not trying to build a great technology. So solving a problem is kind of one of the things I like to think about. And, and I always equate that to how do you tell a great story, right? So at Skype, our great story was simple, free calling. Uh, at Wix, where I'm the chairman, it's all about free websites. How important is storytelling when you're trying to articulate both to investors and to the market what you're doing? And to employees and people that work with you. That's right. a very, very important thing to have people understand what it is. And that's why I spend most of my time trying to do is simplify what we're trying to do. Because I understand a lot is happening behind there. One of the benefits I have is I'm not, and it actually sounds counterintuitive, is I have some very technical co-founders, but I'm not one of those. So I don't need to know every maturation of everything. So I'm able to kind of say, take a big picture and say, what are we trying to do here? And explain 90% of what we're trying to do and not 100%. So let's see how good you're at it, because tell us about your new baby now, Oriente, which is operating in the Philippines, uh, in, in Indonesia, and soon many other Southeast Asia markets. First of all, what is it? And then kind of why Southeast Asia? Yeah, so what it is, is we're basically uh, enabling commerce between buyers and sellers, which is mostly merchants who are offline and buyers. So 97% of off, um, uh, transactions are still offline. 2% of people have credit cards, and 70% of people don't have a bank account. So the big issue there is credit. People don't have an opportunity to get their hands on credit. And so that's what we're kind of solved for. So people in that region are unbanked? Uh, yeah, they're very, very unbanked. So. It's not, and, and it also there's no credit bureaus, for example. So when, uh, when you're living in markets like uh, Austria or anywhere in the developed world, people tend to have good credit or bad credit. In these markets, they have credit or no credit. 
It's a very different, they don't have a, it's not about just having, you don't know who's good or bad. There's no information on these people. So sometimes as, a, as an investor, I, I invest mostly in Europe and, and in Israel. Um, and every time I go to Asia, I'm taken aback by the speed at which things get done out there. When, when was Oriente started and how many employees do you have? Yeah, so we launched uh, in May. Uh, and we started about 18 months ago, and we've gone from eight employees to about 1,700 employees. So we've grown very, very rapidly. 1,700 employees. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and you have that, that's a very, in, in China the same way, things just happen at a much, much faster pace. Yeah. And so, as I understand, your business model is an online and offline model. Correct. Right? This, for internet people, is often a bit surprising because you would think it's counterintuitive. Tell us why that's so important in those markets. Because most of the things that are happening are offline. So basically, people shop offline. There's no real great logistics system. And another thing is that a lot of the money that goes through, because there's no bank accounts and there's no credit bureaus and credit cards, is that the gray economy thrives and cash economy thrives. So being offline and online is very, very critical. The interesting part was this was exactly like China was 12 to 15 years ago when you know, we were at Skype doing what we were doing, that was the big thing was, was the offline, acquiring people offline, bringing them onto your digital platform and capturing them there. So Southeast Asia is about 650, 700 million people, so Correct. larger than the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, largely a forgotten market from the perspective of Europe, yep. although we try to encourage all of our startups to think about it. Um, you know, you moved out there a number of years ago. What drove you to leave Europe and figure something out out there? Well, I think the optimism there is a very, very fun thing to be a part of. The average age in these markets is 24 years old. If you look at China, it's 41, Japan, it's 50, and in Europe, it's about 43. Wow. So it's a much, much younger population. Economic growth is 7% a, a year. So it's growing like wildfire. And people are truly excited about the future. And I think yeah. that's a really, really important thing. Yeah, so as, as if you are a startup founder, Europe, of course, is a good place to be, uh, but Southeast Asia sounds pretty exciting too, right? Um, and, and, but one difference I have found in those markets is the need for local partners is truly important. And tell us a little bit about, A, your partners there and, and, and kind of what they bring to what you're trying to do. Yeah, we learned this also at Skype. We, you know, we did partnerships in each market. Li Kai-shing you know, and Selena mm -hmm. Chow were our bigger partners in China. Um, but if you take our partner, JG Summit, for example, these are family businesses. 85% of Filipinos, there's 100 million of them, buy something from JGS each month. So they own the biggest airline, the second biggest retailer. They own a bank. They own third of the biggest tele, um, uh, 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 electric company. They, they have a, a ton of different, biggest food processing companies. So these yeah. are, have massive reach in these markets. So that's very, very important to us. And then Cinemas in Indonesia, 30 billion, a family of business as well, 30 billion in revenue last year. Very big in banking, insurance, the biggest, um, paper company in the world. They're just, they're, they have a, a huge footprint in these markets. They're really, really important to what we do. So it's very counterintuitive for me as an investor to think that these type of partnerships would work. You know, at Skype, we had none. At Wix, we don't believe in them particularly. We think uh, we're best in doing things on ourselves. Um, and then when I, when I reconnected with Jeff and his partners and they started telling me about this strategy, I, I became very curious about it and, and said to myself, can you succeed without it? And generally your answer is no, you need this. Yeah, you need these partners to get going here because again it's such an analog market and I think that for anybody entrepreneurs that here that want to do things in Southeast Asia it's important to understand that it's still very analog it will rapidly shift but it's it, it, it's a it's a market where people are very technology literate but yet on the other hand the, uh, the the system and the infrastructure is not there yet so like you know you have to kind of have this in mind when you go there so you have offices in the Philippines offices in Indonesia and your tech is where mostly in Shanghai and Taiwan. So we have about 260 engineers. Uh, most of the team, uh, one of my other co-founders was the first employee at a company called Lufax, which is a spin-off of Ping-On. So just for context, Lufax is a Chinese company valued today at about $45 billion, still privately held. Two billion in profit a year, too. Two billion in profit a so, year. Yeah. That's a real company. Yeah. So yeah, so, so we brought that team together who's built this. And what's happened is that in China has some of the best fintech talent in the world. And it's an amazing shift over a 10 to 15 year period how 
they can go from when we were at Skype, we were importing engineers because China wasn't very good, and now we're exporting all that talent yeah. to Southeast yeah. Asia. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little more about this online to offline and offline to online, yeah. right? H how do they kind of feed off of each other? Well, I think that's the, 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 the thing. It's not that people only do offline or only do online. So first of all, for us, those, both those scenarios are how we get people onto our, on, onto our network. So for us, it's very, very important that from a credit side also, acquiring users offline is great because we see the customer, they put a down payment down, and they're buying a good. So it's also very good for us to do yeah. a risk assessment. Our, our salesperson is also our, our best person at taking it to, to uh, find out if this is actually a real person that we have to kind of, uh, you know, be worried about yeah. or whatnot as, as, a, uh, as a credit risk. So that's important as well. So I think this is an interesting trend as you're thinking about it, this online to offline, offline to online. If you go to the US, Amazon has stores. Mm -hmm. uh, this is becoming more of a reality. And we as a firm began thinking about this a number of years ago and by saying the, the real world is a world where you're going to do a bit of both. Correct. And so we certainly encourage all of our startups to think about that. How are you going to survive in a world that requires those two things, right? And, I, yep. and money, of course, is a, is a, is a big one. Mm -hmm. So Southeast Asia is also a place where we keep talking and we keep hearing about the concept of this super app, mm -hmm. the one-stop shop, right? Uh, tell us a bit about that, how you fit into it, because there's two big ones in Southeast Asia, right? One is Grab and the other one is Gojack. Yeah. How, can, will they succeed? What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think everyone will succeed and everybody has their own idea of what success is. And so, you know, the idea that you're going to be able to do everything yourself, I think, is a very, very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm focused on two to three markets right now doing one thing, and I'm exhausted running around. Trying to do eight markets doing all these kind of things is much more difficult. So I think it's going to be a challenge to be able to pull all that stuff off. The only place where you've had super apps be successful is China. And that took a place from a company called Tencent, who's a you know, half a trillion dollar company now, but they had 400 million users when they decided to try to go into all these different markets. So that's a big, big difference. And they were a profitable, Very profitable. gaming company that yep. could use that cash to do something Pretty else, invest. right? Yes. So, so, so the super app, there is a super app in Barcelona, mm -hmm. a company called Globo, for those of you who are interested. It's also a food delivery one, but they can do all sorts of other stuff. Very interesting company. Um, but again, the real question is, can you finance other activities when you have a negative unit economics business? That, that, that's a difficult thing to do as well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that is a hard thing. And I think that if you're doing food delivery and transport, that's okay. If you're trying to do food delivery, transport, be a doctor, be a, a lot of other things, that becomes more challenging. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So storytelling, right? Okay. Give us the two minute pitch if I'm a, a customer of yours. Why would I want to take credit from you? Well, I think that the, 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 what we're trying to do in general is, again, we're trying to facilitate commerce. So what's happened is we're basically allowing people to get a, a virtual credit card. So what happens is that we allow people who come into department stores that we then see and whatnot, we, we'll give them a loan of about 100 US dollars to you know, buy something. But what we're also doing is we're allowing people who don't qualify for that, we're giving them a $5 loan to go to 7-Eleven, go to Mini Stop, these kind of things, to kind of build their credit up. So what we're doing is we're allowing people to build a credit profile themselves, which then will allow them over time to be able to buy anything they want in, in all, all of our merchant network, and also allow us to sort of sell other uh, services or give you other services on top of that. Because in these particular markets, the lack of data is a real problem for people to get the things that they deserve. Okay. So we're not in the business of selling anyone else's data. What we're here to do is say, let's, let, let's leverage what you have to kind of get services that you deserve. Because, I mean, the, the, the average um, loan price in these places is 20 to 30% a month. So it's a big difference. So I've been a very outspoken anti-fintech investor. So have I. Uh, my close friend I runs, was at a, fintech, before, I was run, the runs a fintech company. Yeah. Yes, he did go to the dark side for a number of years, yeah. having gone from Skype, then he went to became a, became a venture capitalist at Atomico, co-founded the firm there as well. Uh, and fortunately for me and for him, he left and started Oriente. But as I have been quite negative about this because every fintech company I, I happened to meet essentially thought that they could easily reinvent what banks had done for hundreds of years, right? So. Is your credit rating approach to figure out how people are using their phone and their mouses, or is there actually some knowledge that you're developing there? Well, I think the overall what you say is an in interesting thing. If you look at what's happened, and there's been a lot of successful uh, companies doing, uh, trying to reinvent banking in Europe that we've seen and also in the US, 
And what that comes down to is that there's a big, a, a lot of margin in, within these banking sets, um, system. And like, again, we talked yesterday like about new bank in Brazil. The NPS scores are very low. People hate their banks. In Europe and the US, there is a credit bureau. It's not great, but it works okay. Banks aren't perfect, but they work okay. So there's a little difference there. And, and the markets that we're talking about, again, over 50% of people borrow money from their family or, or from a loan shark each month. There is no system. So what we're doing is we're basically using a digital uh, solution to build the whole entire infrastructure, which is very, very different that's happening kind of in Europe where you're trying to say, okay, how do we disrupt an existing thing? Like a disrupting business. We're actually starting, we're building from the beginning and scratch. To so build you think it. of yourself as an infrastructure company. We're an infrastructure, yeah, that's exactly what we are. In the yeah. same way, if you look at Alibaba when they got going compared to Amazon, Alibaba was like, there is no logistics company. The post office is awful. They had to build all of that yeah. themselves. And in the end, that makes an amazing end end solution because they built it all from scratch. Yeah. Where Amazon could at least use a US Postal Service or the Deutsche Post, all those kind of things. That's the difference. You've raised over $150 million. $150 million, US, uh, 150 million equity funding, yes. Yeah, and then of course you have the loan book that you have yes. to raise as well. Um, why is Southeast Asia so hot right now? I mean, the demographics are fantastic and the growth rates are fantastic. What I do find interesting is how important it is for Japanese companies and Chinese companies who are investing a ton of money into the market and you haven't done the same thing in Europe and the US. I don't know if it's just a longer flight or whatnot, but you haven't seen a lot of that. And we'll see no. if that kind of changes over time because it's a great market to get involved in and I'm surprised we haven't seen more uh, Western companies in these markets. And at the risk of you saying something you shouldn't, what are the next markets that you're gonna go for? Well, I don't know. We'll look at some, you know, like there's a big one next door mm -hmm. that starts with an I and ends with an A that is something we could look at. Okay. And Vietnam as well. But we'll, you know, the important thing is in these markets is that there's a, there's a lot of, it's a big job to do and there's a lot of uh, uh, economic return you can kind of get just in these. If, if, you just, if we just did Philippines and Indonesia, just think about that. That's already 350 million people. Just that. Yeah. The size of the United States. Yeah. People don't realize how big these places are. Can you tell us a little bit about the amount of loans you've g generated in the last, since you, since you launched? We're, we're probably doing about 70 to 80,000 loans a month. 80,000 loans, loans a month. a month, yes, exactly. And our goal is growing out our merchant network and then kind of having our customers repeat loans. Yeah. We're not trying to make very long loans. We're gonna have them use loans over and over again so we learn more about the customer. So last question, we're about 10 years into a, into a bull market. Mm -hmm. Everything is going well, right? Default rates have tick, have, are always low mm -hmm. in bull markets. Uh, how have you been doing? Who, me? Your company, mm -hmm. Oriente, yeah. in terms of managing defaults. Very well, but I agree. I think the one thing that people always talk about is our competitors grab or Akulaku and whatnot. And the reality at the end of the day is that our biggest, we won't have issues with our competitors until one or two more credit cycles. So we're much more focused on dealing with our loan book and that not blowing up than we are focused on our competitors. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions here. One from Jurgen. Uh, what knowledge that you got from Skype has helped you succeed at Oriente? The ability to scale, that was the one thing. I now know how to scale a business. Silicon Valley is not better than uh, European companies at coming up with ideas or building technology. It's that they, have, they know how to scale businesses better. And that's something that, you know, you look at what's, who's come out of Skype, you know, Tavid from TransferWise who founded that, or Jan Talon, all these brilliant people. It's all we learn how to scale businesses. That last question's good. Yeah. What's the best way to approach local partners in Southeast Asia? They must receive a lot of requests, of course. Yeah, you, they, yeah, you need to know, need, know somebody who knows somebody, and you must know somebody who knows them, that's for sure. And you'd be surprised how much they're happy to have help from uh, other people. They want to they be more digitally focused, they, they just don't know how. So we're talking about these large conglomerates, right? Yeah. And, and they're looking for people who've had success in the past. And perhaps the last question, this is it, it's, uh, you know, these apps, mostly talking about the, uh, about the super apps, are built on exploitation of workforce. Is that fair? I think it's partially fair, absolutely it's fair, um, is that it's doing a lot of good for the end consumer, but what is it doing for the workers, right? And I think that, you know, one thing that we do at Oriente, we very much want to play within the rules, and we want to make sure that we work with regulators, and I think it's important that, yeah, that, that the adverse worker doesn't get screwed. My father was a union president, so I'm kind of biased. I will know today the IPO of Uber is coming up, right? So <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, no Appreciate problem. it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Well done, sir.